All right. Hello, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Yeah. My name is Alex McLean. I work at Leonine Public Affairs right down in downtown Montpelier, right next to the police station. And we are here to make sure everyone's in the right room. We're talking about uh, financial recovery and resilience. So a couple of ground rules just before we dive into things. So we've been in crisis and in, in tragedy. And I know there's a lot of high emotions, tough, really tough, heartbreaking, heart-wrenching stuff. And I just want to make sure that in all of this, Please share your emotions, your thoughts, but please be respectful and kind to one another. Also want folks to think about a little bit of self-regulation. If you're somebody who tends to like to talk a lot, think about that a little bit. We'd love to keep comments to one to two minutes, just so we can get to everybody. Similarly, if you're someone who doesn't like to talk in public, really encourage you to stretch yourself a little bit we do really want to hear from everybody this evening. Um, and then the big thing is, we are here to try and identify ideas and solutions. Obviously, the inverse of that are the challenges and the problems, and we need to understand those. But we don't want to come out of here with just a list of problems. We want to come out of here with a list of ideas and actionable impactful, and hopefully unifying solutions. Um, the goal is to come out with one to three, so we'll see how well we do. Um, as Paul described a little bit, we'll spend the first 15 minutes doing just a landscape analysis of what exists now, what financial resources exist for folks, what don't. Um, we'll then spend the bulk of the time on ideas, and then the remaining 15 minutes on trying to get those ideas that we have down to one or one to three priorities. Um, I'm at Leonine Public Affairs. As I said, I am an expert on communicating. I am not an expert on finance. So luckily, we do have some subject area experts here. Um, these folks are here to hear your ideas, to add their wisdom, their knowledge, their advice, they're not here to lecture any of us or give big speeches. But they're really here to kind of take the ideas that we have and make sure that they add their knowledge and their expertise to that. So I'll just have you two introduce yourselves. Sure. Uh, Sorry. I'm Mike Kicek. I'm the state treasurer uh, here in Vermont. I live in Winooski, but I have worked in Montpelier the last decade or so. And our office is at the pavilion. We're impacted as well, but um, happy to be here and happy to provide any type of um, advice and, and direction that I can to the discussions. I'm Melissa Bowney. I'm the director of Central Vermont Economic Development Corporation, which is one of the 12 um, regional nonprofits, RDCs, that cover the state. My organization provides free business support for Washington County and three towns in Orange, and we have a flood recovery center set up at 89 Main Street, which is where Labrio used to be, so business owners can drop in to complete paperwork um, or meet with a counselor about best next steps for their business. Alex, yeah. can I get a clarification? Is, we, the, is the focus of the discussion uh, businesses and homeowners, or is it finance, or is the focus of this, or perhaps in addition, the focus more macro uh, funding for the necessary broader measures that might be taken to prepare? Good question. I think that is not predetermined. I think we need to hear, the hope is in the first 15 minutes during that situational analysis, what is the most pressing things that you all feel in terms of that question? And if it's all coming from businesses or all coming from individuals, then that's the answer. Okay. If it's a larger macro discussion about this is what we need for the future for flood resilience, then we would go there. Okay. And it could also be a mix of both, right? Thank you. Do we have Sam Buckley here? OK, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Hi, uh, Sam Buckley. I'm the Director of Energy and Broadband Lending at Vermont Economic Development Authority, also colloquially known as BIDA. Um, I'm also a Montpelier resident for the last 20 years. And, yeah, mostly I have, have experience in the areas of 
commercial lending with a focus on economic development. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming. All right. So let's dive in. We're going to do our first piece again on the on the current landscape. So what financial resources are available right now? For immediate recovery. And I want folks to think about both financing options available from the city, from the government, but also from philanthropy. What's available to folks now? Yes. As I understand it, FEMA money is in grant form to residents and in loan form at an 8%, right? It's 4 to 8 four to eight percent rate to businesses. Um, I don't know what state money is available at this point. Okay. Um, I think, so the small business loan I can speak to what's been available to businesses. Please. So I own Positive Pie. Mm -hmm. um, so, so far we've gotten $4,000 from Montpelier Alive as a grant. That was given to us pretty quickly, which was great. Um, we've been offered $20,000 from the state, but not one business has gotten it yet. Their applications mostly have been denied. They've been very difficult to get. We are reapplying. I think businesses hopefully will get it, but no one I know of has gotten it yet. The SBA, I think only one business in town has received yet. Um, they're also mostly denying the applications for very picky things that have been very challenging. Um, just today, a new application went in from Montpelier Alive that we've been offered another grant, I think from the funding that's come in, and it's between 1,000 and 20,000 depending on need. Um, and that's, and then our own personal GoFundMe's. But I mean, for a business our size and many other restaurants, we need like three to 500,000 and it's very minimal what we're getting. That's a drop of the bucket. Yeah. I didn't hear the name of your... Positive Pie. Good, thank you. Thank you. If folks also would be willing just to say their name, um, that would be great. And I was terribly remiss in not introducing Maggie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so Maggie Lenz is going to be the note taker this evening, and then she will, all of the ideas that come up, whether or not they get to that top three or not, will be shared with Paul and the larger group. Um, but she will also be helping towards the end, kind of bring, narrowing down many ideas, hopefully, that come out of this discussion. My name is Melissa, and Carlo is my partner that also is positive pie. Thank you, Melissa. It's someone that has seen about 200 businesses. I just want to echo what Melissa said um, in terms of its accuracy and the really difficult reality that many business owners, I, I think Melissa, every single point that Melissa just said is something we hear multiple times a day, every day from many businesses as their reality. And, and is uh, Bob Jones, my failure, um, is, the, is the struggle because it's digital in other words, the applications have to be, you know, scrolled down and menu this, that, and that. They're prone to potential mistakes. You, you're, are you my digital guy here? I, 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 I share your frustration, um, I guess, with both the state and, and the feds, but is there such a thing as paper applications anymore? No. <laughs> And I think the reason every business is denied is different. It's mm -hmm. just very nitpicky. But even getting the $20,000 that's in that, and it's just not enough. And, and taking the SBA loan for most businesses isn't exciting. It, well, it's not exciting because it's a loan. I, it's a loan, and it has interest, but low, but it's still a right. 20 year mortgage. I mean, 30. 30. In the back? Yeah, my name's Scott Cameron. I own the building at 126 Main Street. I've got four apartments upstairs in retail space on the first floor. And uh, my son and I also own another business that ran Yankee Wine and Spirits on that first floor. And so we've got you know, the double whammy of 
trying to restore the building and uh, then to rebuild the store, which is totally wrecked. I mean, all our coolers, all our shelving, our counter spaces, our electric. Um, a quick thing on the, the what they call the BGAP um, grants, which are the, from the state. Um, it is a, a electronic process. It's not bad, but if you don't have the skills, for example, if you don't have your, your uh, tax returns in electronic form, if you don't have your profit and loss, your insurance um, policies in electronic form, it's tougher. I mean, I had it, so I could do it. But the other thing was that, you know, we're all being told that um, if you don't have it done right, you're going to be rejected. You're going to have to come back and do it again. The rumors are back at the end of the line, too. Um, the problem is, so on the one hand, you're being told to get it in as quick as you can. But in many cases, you can't, you couldn't get estimates of the, of the things that you wanted to do. So you're trying to ballpark it. We have no idea of what uh, the agency is going to accept uh, in terms of the bids. I mean, I had some bids, and uh, with the building, it was really quite easy to, uh, to quantify $100,000 or more in losses. That, that was a no-brainer. Um, with the business, I'll give you just an example. I, uh, I probably lost about 60000 in inventory. I had, as part of my cleanup, I had an inventory of all the, all the wine, beer, all the other things that got thrown away. That inventory was too big to download into the VGAP. Mm -hmm. so, so I couldn't, it was, so, you know, so I told them what it was, but I don't know if it would be accepted. And, um, and there doesn't seem to be any real way to communicate. There's no, there's no way to call and talk to the person. Um, and and I'm, not, I'm not criticizing this. I think that it's an enormous task that the agency took on on very short notice. And, um, and so it's, I'm sure it's doing the best it can. But as we sit here, none of us know. Um, I guess some people have already been told that they didn't have enough information. So I guess I'm feeling good because no one's contacted me and thrown me out of the queue. But, um, but we don't know. And so there's that, there's that uh, kind of uh, kind of adds to the trauma to tell you the truth. Um, we're trying to make plans to restore it. You know, in my case, I got to think about the building first. I had tenants with no electricity for two weeks, no hot water for another week. I don't have heating systems for them right now when winter's coming on. I can't put my furnace back in the basement or the oil burns. Um, so we have to come up with all new systems. We have to bring all the electric up to, the, to above it. So these things are, and I have to do that all before I even think about trying to restore the store. Um, and so uh, I think you know one of the problems again with that VGAP is that we just, as we sit here, we just don't know where we stand. And uh, and it's and it's I don't think it's been a month yet, but it's probably been 20 days. And uh, you know you get you get we're getting no feedback. Yeah. And again, it's not saying that as a criticism. I think that the city. On Clear Alive, on Clear Strong, and State um, have really done a, a really good job under tremendous stress. Um, but I, but I, I think that the, the delay is going to cause more and more people to fall by the wayside and just not be able to come back. Thank you. That's, thank you for sharing that story. It's helpful to understand. No point of clarification. B gap or B? B B G A B. B E. -E it's an acronym. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, I don't have anything to say about Lindy Biggs um, about funding sources, but I am here because my husband and I have been writing grant proposals for 30 years, and I know all of your businesses have so much to that you're dealing with, and I I'm just here to offer help for people who might need help grant writing. Right. Because all those details, you know, it's a, I've never applied for this grant, but <coughs> after one or two, we would know how to do it. And you're, all of you are doing it once. So that's, that's why I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. Yes. Hi, Rebecca Bonisi. I am not in the financial space or a business owner, but I have see my community thrive. 
I've heard that in the Inflation Reduction Act that there's a lot of money that can go into resiliency, but it needs a place to land. Mm. And green banks are an opportunity for that money to land in a place. And from what I understand, that the legislature will be studying, or you can um, speak to that perhaps, will be studying it over the next year. But my concern is, is that a long period of study will lose valuable time for our community that that money can be applied in meaningful and impactful ways. So I just want to put that out there as a potential source of funding, but from what I've heard, it needs a place to land. I can speak to that a little bit, and granted it's going to come from somewhat organizational self-interest, but um, Vermont Economic Development Authority, Vermont Housing Finance Agency, and the Vermont Bond Bank can all serve as, and do serve as de facto green banks in terms of accessing funds that will be coming down from the Inflation Reduction Act. And those will, they're going to take a long time regardless of what the state does and it's studying or setting things up, but, you know, not to get too far into the weeds, but like the the NOFO for the for the national organizations accessing those funds um, is due at the end of September, and the funds won't start flowing through the system until middle of next year to agencies like ours, who would be, and possibly a new green bank if it happened, but would be applying for. So there are places for those funding funds to land. Yes. So just uh, to follow up on that, I think that the Vermont Bond Bank um, sorry, Jill Briggs Campbell uh, at the Fifth Montclair. I also worked with the Agency of Education and I was in the Emergency Operations Center team, so uh, I'm going to try not to act in the So, thinking about supports for individuals um, available uh, is the FEMA Individual Assistance, which has like an alphabet soup of programs underneath it. Um, but I think that sometimes. Because of past experiences like Irene or just sort of the general reputation of FEMA, I think folks are skeptical of FEMA and engaging in individual assistance. They think, oh, I'm not going to see a penny for 10 years or whatever it may be. But there are really immediate resources, financial resources that are available in China <coughs> for individual assistance. So things like immediate rental assistance, like check in the bank kind of thing, um, you know, $700 to replace the lost belongings. And $300 for cleanup supplies. And now in Washington County, just as a, a few days ago, um, we've now qualified for something that's called FEMA Direct Housing Assistance. And those are those like big, sort of what we think of as kind of the big long term um, rehousing of folks if they're living in a place that's no longer going to be safe. Um, you know, what we think of as like the, the FEMA trailers, kind of those temporary housing or new houses or new units being built. Um, so I think it's really, really important. I know that folks can be skeptical of FEMA, but to what extent, um, and to what extent we can identify the barriers, I think our community probably is doing a better job than almost anywhere else, but what are the barriers that prevent people who would qualify and are in need from signing up for for FEMA individual assistance, um, and then helping them in whatever way we can as a community to get them through that process and access those resources. Um, critically with the housing piece, if they are not signed up for FEMA individual assistance, which as of right now <coughs> has a September 12th deadline to do, and we're, I think the state's looking for an extension on that, we'll probably get it. So that's one really critical piece. Um, and then the other piece that's maybe also a little bit more long term is the Vermont Recovery Fund. Um, there's discussion about setting up sort of local recovery and resilience sort of committees that can help individuals a year from now or 18 months from now or two years from now if we have those long term flood impacts after you know the, the big dogs are out of the, the picture, right? Um, and those local resiliency committees can access those Vermont community fund resources. So those are some of the things that are in conversation right now. Thank you. That's helpful to understand. Can I? Yes, sure. Go for it. Uh, 
I think I can do this in five or six sentences. Um, after the banking crisis, um, I think it was 2008, and uh, I progressively learned that uh, that I wasn't able to pay my employees, and they hung on. I was doing a newspaper. They hung on without being paid, and they hung on. And eventually, they came to me and said, "We can't hang on anymore." And uh, when I added up the damages against the business, the papers, debts, we had $30,000 that we owed, which seemed uh, an impossible sum of money. Uh, the key thing I learned from that experience, by the way, we paid back all that money over time, and we re-employed people, and we got back on our feet, but the key thing I learned was that it's important for a business to be able to hang in there and keep some of its employees and pay off some of its debts and have a debt repayment plan and come back. But if you, but if, like an organism, like a living organism, if the organism dies, there's no coming back. And what happened in this period, it was about a three to five year period of paying back. My staff agreed to be paid back over time. And they got a small check every month. I think that lasted for five years. And other people saw that we weren't quitting. And they forgave debt. And we were able to keep the paper alive pay back our debt, and get back on top of it. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, it's important to figure out how to keep businesses alive in the short term, and have a plan for paying back debt so that they can come out of it. And in fact, as I've been listening, I've one more sentence. As I've been listening here, I've been thinking, If we bring our efforts together with all of their problems and all of their insufficiencies and fears, if we bring to ourselves together to deal with this emergency, we could become a bit of a case study for other jurisdictions who are likely to be facing the same kinds of problems. I don't think what, we, what we are, we're facing is insurmountable. But I do think our intelligence and imagination needs to be plugged in in a very positive way in the comment. Bravo. Thank you. Yes, yeah, I just want to say that I don't want to um, like lay out a specific plan because I don't have one. <laughs> but I think that there's just absolutely no way that any of this can get done without the feds. And it really is important that we identify and put together an advocacy plan um, that you know has leadership. And we have a plan of action to really lean on our congressional delegation. I just want to quickly say we have been kind of forming a downtown Montpelier business advocacy group. Um, we've met, met a few times on Zoom. We've met with a few lobbyists. We met this morning with Rebecca Amos. Amos. Ramos. 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 Okay. Yes. And, and I've met with Kevin Ellis. Your name actually came up. Um, and. Um, that's what our purpose is, is to really try to formulate the needs of businesses and get it to the feds through our politicians. They were saying it might be helpful to go through you as being a financial person already plugged in. Um, but we, we really have needs in order to keep it viable. Every business, I mean, most businesses really need more help than we're getting to be able to survive. Um, and so we're trying to form a group that really um, pushes the agenda to people where, that need to. And, and that's what, and, and Rebecca's really helping us, and Kevin said he'll help us too. And we're, we need to write 
some kind of like a two-page quick document of, and they actually wanted to maybe come to you for some help. I think you are coming to me. Okay. <laughs> I think you're so coming we up just need, they want to find out what, what businesses need, what the costs are, how, how much we're short, get together a plan and put it out there. So it is kind of formulating through the businesses, but we definitely need a, a lot of help. That's great. So, Carrie, oh, you can, one second. You, yeah, so I ahead. just, I'm just cognizant of time and heard a fair amount about the business plight of business owners and the vibrancy of the downtown. Is that, am I getting consensus moving forward as we move into the next kind of section of this, which is ideas about how to help with that challenge, that that's the pressing challenge here? Yes. Yeah. Where do you go um, somewhere else? I, not for me at all, in answer to your question. Yes. Um, and what I wanted to say was, it's great that there's advocacy for, for businesses and great that there's so much support and great that there's a lot of attention being paid to it. Um, but the individual assistance is, and the individual support is um, is really lacking. I think there's this idea out there that, well, FEMA's got people, non-business people covered and it's not true. Um, a lot of people are getting money from FEMA, but FEMA doesn't cover um, it doesn't cover the cost of moving all of your stuff up out of the basement, which we all have to do. The, those of us who were flooded in downtown Montpelier have found out in many cases after already starting work that we, we, no, you can't just put your furnace back in the basement. You have to put it in your living room or your, I don't know where, we don't know where. And so FEMA doesn't cover that. Um, and then also if you have flood insurance, FEMA doesn't give you any money. Um, which is a lovely whammy as someone who has flood insurance and hasn't gotten any money from flood insurance yet. And probably flood insurance isn't gonna cover getting things up out of the basement either. So um, there are options for small business association loans for, for individuals. It's not just for businesses. So, um, so you know, we're finding ourselves in a position of possibly having to take on debt to be able to fix this that we can't actually afford to do. But then also there are people who, and I don't know if I've got the details right, but um, back in Irene took money from FEMA and uh, it was conditional as my understanding on maintaining flood insurance, but flood insurance is thousands of dollars. And so low income people who could not afford flood insurance continue not to be able to afford it. Now they can't get FEMA money again because they got it once before and they didn't get flood insurance. And so, you know, I've got a neighbor who has no heat and no hot water and no money at all. And, and so I don't know where, where the resources for those folks are. And I'm really, I love the idea of, of, of the downtown, of downtown businesses or, organizing to be, advocate on behalf of businesses. <coughs> What's the equivalent for lower income people who aren't gonna be able to pay to, to fix their, their, their heating systems, their electrical systems, their hot water. I mean, we, we don't have heat. Um, many of us in our house and um, you know we thought this happened in July we've got plenty of time Ooh, actually we live in Vermont we don't have plenty of time it's already getting cold so thank you so I think that's that's how we understand yes please and Watson um, I just want to make sure that I put out a, a source of funds that is relatively small, but I uh, want to get it on the record. So the um, Vermont Association of Realtors um, has a disaster relief fund uh, that can provide up to $500 grants uh, for individuals um, that were impacted by the floods. Um, and then they also have uh, a relief foundation and that ha is up to $2,000 and it can go for one of three things. Um, monthly mortgage expenses uh, for primary residences that were damaged by flooding, uh, rental costs that are due uh, uh, for folks that were displaced from their primary residence, and then um, if folks had to stay at a hotel, uh, they can get reimbursed uh, for um, some of those expenses, uh, again, up to $2,000. So just want to make sure that folks are aware of that resource. I've, I'm, I have not heard a lot of, of people talking about that. Can I just ask a question? Which is, is there, there has to be a place, right, where there's a comprehensive list of all these resources for businesses and individuals? Theoretically, the state has a comprehensive okay. list. I have not checked to see if this one is on it. Okay. It does just feel like it's very disjointed and nobody is aware of I agree. <laughs> yeah. I agree. 
it's also hard because a lot of them, a lot of these sources have very specific things that they will fund. And so, you know, the people on my street, their basements were flooded. They didn't have to move out of their houses. So none of that funds. Right, they would not. Them, but they don't have a furnace and they have no way to get a furnace. And so. I just want to make sure I get everyone in. Yes. Hi, I'm, I'm Eric Jacobson. I'm a resident of Montreal. Um, one of the things I was hoping to find out about a little bit more um, was the um, state funding for the capital as a capital. I recently had an opportunity to be in Albany. And Albany is a very poor city. And one can be certain here at Albany that the residents of Albany are not paying for the infrastructure of their capital city. Nashua, I think, is the same. And the reason why I raise this is because I think there's been a, a chronic um, underfunding of infrastructure such as roads or the septic and water systems that are disastrous in the city. And uh, it's very important that the, the, the federal agencies contribute to get our congressional uh, team to focus on that. But I think there's been a chronic um, underfunding of the, the downtown area. The fact that we ask our business people to, you know, at the time of crisis to come up with the funds to do this, it's really unconscionable. And we've had empty buildings and then, you know, uh, storefronts for a long time in the downtown area. Part of that is because it's just so incredibly expensive, I believe, for these small uh, businesses to operate in uh, Montpelier. The economy is changing. You know, we, we, we will not be able to attract people to our state if we have abandoned, uh, an abandoned downtown. You know, so I really, I'm confused and I really um, don't understand how, we, and how the city is so underfunded and therefore partially unprepared for crisis like this. So perhaps there's more information to understand how we can change and we can um, have this be the capital of, say, Vermont and not a small town. Um, I'm Sally Smith and I live uphill on Murray Hill, which was not effective and feel guilty. Anyway, um, two things. Um, historically, Montpelier has shouldered the burden as a city for the capital. It, it shouldered the burden for financing the first capital, the second capital, and the third capital. And, and so there's a historic habit embedded in this, the financing of the city. And um, that would change. That would take real change. And um, I, you know, that would take real change. Um, the second thing is I am interested, I've um, been paying attention to who funds some of the things that, that we, that, um, Human Services has done, and that the Vermont Community Foundation has been funding a lot of things, um, but especially the nonprofits around. And um, and I know, in the macro sense, um, that there's not a lot of funding for what to do about the flooding and the infrastructure. And so. Um, I'd like to suggest that um, asking the Community Foundation to create an RFP to help us solve these problems and asking, you know, making it a big deal. I mean, here we are in what planners call the bathtub, but it's also a state capital. Um, there's got to be a lot of creative engineers and architects who want to think about this stuff and to make it a national kind of project and ask the Community Foundation to fund that because there's not a lot of money in the state or the federal government for dreaming and creating solutions. And so you, when you say put that out to RFP to solve that, are you saying solve the financing challenges or solve the infrastructure? I'm saying the infrastructure and the water problems, because that's the essence of 
the long term problem. That's a good idea. Um, okay, so before we fully move on to new ideas, I just want to hear from our subject matter experts and see if there's any thoughts, anything that you haven't heard or have heard um, that you want to respond to. Are there any you know, funding sources out there for businesses, individuals, or others that you're aware of that people should know about before we move on to the ideas section? I think Efficiency Vermont is setting up a, a $10 million um, program for, just don't know if it's limited to appliances, or I think it's also heating sources as well. Yeah. So that is, I think, still early stages. But the idea is to come back with greener, you know, and, yeah, exactly right, and to support that through this $10 million. Great. Thank you. I'll assume we'll be doing that because people are going to start with pricing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Two weeks. Yeah. I mean, two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah. Okay, that's great. I've been thinking about um, heat pumps uh, as opposed to um, a propane. I think that's exactly backups, why this program was created, right? For that exact conversation. Yeah. Great. Anything else? Um, so the work that I do at the Plywood Recovery Center is one-on-one -on -one counseling, and I really recommend anyone, even if they're not a business owner, to honestly come in. We have five people. We don't usually have a wait. And I think what we find is Going through steps kind of methodically can be a way to address gaps in funding. Um, the first question we often ask is, do you have a mortgage as an individual? Do you have a do you own the property? Have you talked to your lender? Have you talked to your who you pay your car payment to? Have you told them you were in a flood? Like when you feel 37 bills going past due or three bills going past due or whatever it is, just starting the conversation. Sometimes we sit with people while they make those phone calls, like, and it's okay to, to come in and do that, especially if you're living in a flooded space and working in a flooded space. It's really chaotic to internalize that every day and breaking it into steps and just addressing each thing the same way you would if you were 22 and took out a bunch of credit cards and maxed them out or whatever thing you wound up with where you're feeling this is out of control sitting down with someone and breaking it apart can be a really helpful first step. It doesn't bring you money, but it can bring you relief. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so ideas. So we want to spend the next 30 minutes or so talking about ideas. Heard a few, some that it sounds like they're already starting. Downtown business advocacy, potentially is there an opportunity for an individual, uh, potentially low income organization that would do something similar? Uh, my name is Jeff Squires, <coughs> excuse me, and um, a couple of thoughts. One is that as I'm listening, it sounds like not enough money and not fast enough. Nowhere near enough money and nowhere near fast enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, the federal government will be a great source of financing for uh, the macro level remediation if we build new things or buy a bunch of property to get the flood and so forth, and there's periodic pieces of legislation that you, we can plug into, and we have a very good congressional delegation. But you know, is there a special session to be called by the state legislature? Uh, is there the ability, Mr. Treasurer, for the state of Vermont to bond an emergency fund or to, in some other manner, self-help? so that people aren't waiting to fill out forms and nobody calls you back, but rather it's something that's being done here in Vermont and being done in real time, to Nat's point about enough so that, you know, the liquor store can reopen. We're all going crazy. So, that's an idea, and I don't know. I heard there was some legislative conversation scheduled for later in the week, but you know, this is uh, gigantic and uh, warrants a full, uh, uh, full blown response, not, not observing how little towns are doing. Uh, because I share your view that uh, it's tough to just do this all on your bootstrap. Do you want to respond immediately? That one in terms of the uh, is it you know is it possible to bond an emergency fund? Well, the I mean I guess the 
I guess I have two thoughts. One, just on the emergency fund or bonding generally. I mean, when you're bonding, right, those are things that have to get paid back. So you just want to think, is there a funding source for it to get paid back or is there not? And it's just something you want to think about. And then what's the impact of taking out more debt? And the state's generally been moving in the direction of less debt over time, which has been giving us more cash to spend. Um, but we're in a unique situation where we do have a lot of cash as a state. There's a lot of money that's been appropriated but not yet spent. Um, I think our our cash on hand in the office this morning was $2.3 billion or something in that regard, which is way larger than historically it normally is. So there, it's not to say there's not resources there. And then from a revenue side, <clears throat> the revenues have been really strong in Vermont. At, you know, that $30 million, the $10 million for the appliance and uh, heat pump program and the $20 million for the business program, that was sort of redirected from, you know, excess spending, you know, excess revenue rather, during the, um, you know, the midpoint uh, consensus forecast. So there are, there are opportunities for the state to redirect money in the meantime before the legislature comes in. Um, but the other thought I have is, like whether it's bonding or whether it's putting together a program or whatever it is, uh, it's really helpful to get a sense of like, what is the ultimate number that we yeah. need to hit? And that, because you could say, let's bond for 20 million or 70 million, but what is that gonna do relative to what the need is? And, I mean the full need, like what's the what's the unmet need of the individuals, what's the unmet need of the city and the, and the there, businesses? May I ask? Yes. Is there a process underway? You know, I think there's a ton of baseline analysis that's required really before you make any right. big decisions. But that's basically, there's nothing in the way of initiating that. And uh, I don't know how many communities are in the same boat as Montpelier, but I got to believe somebody here has an order of magnitude sense. So, yeah, I agree with you. There should be a big number, and that number ought to be goal, and there ought to be the action taken by this body and the governor to act on it. Because if, you know, everybody's forgotten about Montpelier because now we're all thinking about Hawaii. And next week we'll forget about Hawaii. So yeah. if we just wait and don't sell help, uh, every, a lot of businesses are going to fail, and a lot of people are going to have the hardships that my friend here was talking about. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm one of your uh, three senators for Washington County. So and you had a question about a special session. Yeah. Uh, and so we have uh, already had some conversation about uh, um, basically a, a relief uh, bill or flood flood related uh, bill or set of bills, and we we anticipate that it's there's a very good chance that we're going to have a special session anyway because of the uh, potential impeachment. And while that is going on, we may be able to do some other business. And so then the, the question is, uh, if we're able to pass some flood relief bill or bills during that time, what should be in it? Yeah. And, and I think that comes to this question of like, what is the number? Um, it also, um, you know, if there are specifics, like how do we divide up, you know, what the need is or whatnot, um, that's, that's another question. One of the, I'm gonna, um, pick on the, the city of Montpelier, like the, the city uh, for a second, because one of the ideas that came from them, which I think is a good one, uh, is uh, diverting some of the housing money uh, that was already allocated uh, to particularly uh, buildings that, according to FEMA, either need to be bought out uh, because they're substantially damaged um, or they need to be elevated. And for a lot of those homes <clears throat> that were substantially damaged, a lot of them are uh, affordable housing. And so uh, we're, we're looking at, you know, the potential displacement of, uh, of a number of folks. So uh, that's one thing that's on my radar to ask for. Um, so, but other, other ideas welcome. And, and you're just, just for clarification, you say the money for housing, you mean the money that was in the state budget for housing that passed? Uh, I believe so, the, right, that passed, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. yeah. Well, so uh, we're talking about uh, sometime in like the October, uh, September, October time frame, uh, but we don't really know. And it's not even totally certain that it is gonna happen. It's just, I think it's likely, but I don't know. Who, who calls a special session? That's a great I question. I think the governor, governor has to. The governor calls a special session. Okay, yep, I got that through. So, I have two ideas. Um, so, one is that could both the city of Montpelier and the state at large take a look at the funds that it has, sorry, acting suit bill, the ARPA SFRF funds, 
And um, so those are part of the big COVID federal leaf, and a lot of them have infrastructure um, uses, uh, and many of them, I believe, might correct me, continue to be a little bit undersubscribed or not fully baked yet. So um, because we've got a little bit of a longer tail on that, it, would it be possible for the city to look at some of the, the places that it has maybe prioritized funds and pivot? or some of the larger state projects, which may have been super awesome ideas before the July flood, but maybe we need to use that to address some immediate infrastructure needs. So that was one. And then the second was um, thinking about, again, individual needs and how we connect individuals with specific needs with resources and take the burden off of individuals to have to like go with the efficiency of the mock grant. Could, um, us, I'm just, us, like the, the collective, we um, set up essentially a, um, a small group of folks who probably do this in their day to day life and are fabulous at it, but to essentially serve as that kind of advocacy, but to collect specific needs from individuals who have been impacted, identify, and we're, we're actually trying to do this as well in Barrie and up in like Harvick as well. So I'm on the Individual and Family Needs Recovery Task Force, first half of ever. And one of the things we're constantly saying is like, we don't know. We don't know what's happening at 127 Elm Street and what that family is experiencing. And trying to talk to the schools and like, what do you know? What are you hearing? Capstone, what have you got? But if we have a local group that can <coughs> Candace, go door to door, they know that person, they can call their neighbor, they can say, what exactly do you need? And be able to start to collect that data. Um, because I think what we are hearing is like, we need to identify the need. And in order to do that, we have to collect specific data, and then we have to send that data up to the state, up to FEMA, when we make a specific request. Mm -hmm. So, in and also, by having that kind of, as we did brilliantly with the immediate flood volunteer effort, like y'all, it was incredible. I was in a lot of towns, and like nobody did it better than we did. Um, but also mutually, right? So again, continuing to identify those specific needs, and then like, oh, you know, if you need a boiler, I can help you install that boiler, or you can move it to your kitchen, um, or whatever it may be, or we can help you, we've got a bunch of brilliant grant writers, which is a really key skill set. We can help these four people apply for the efficiency of Vermont grant and get key points installed. So can we do that triage, but also start to back it up? Great ideas. Thank you. Scott? Um, this is kind of an infrastructure issue, too, but I think it relates to financing. Um, <clears throat> I've been a building owner now for 11 years, and business owner down there too. Um, but I'm an attorney, I don't know much about restoring buildings and uh, I'm learning a lot. So one of the things we talked about is furnaces, they can't be down in the basement. We talked about efficiency in Vermont, we can do many splits of different things. But here in Montpelier, for example, what I found is I just had someone go in and assess my building for it, see if I could put these heat pumps in every unit. Well. The real problem is I can't I can't put them in the front units because I'm in a storage district. I can't hang them off the front of the building. Um, we have something in this city which is um, a great idea which has not really come to fruition, and that is the city. Okay, um, and the reason it hasn't come to fruition is because it costs so much to put that infrastructure in to extend it that people not enough signed up for it, cost, they're all, they're all, um, you get it on the bond, and they're paying for the heat, so, so their costs are much more than if they were at oil or gas. But we talked about this infrastructure bill. If that infrastructure bill could fund the extension of city heat and the installation of that to every building in the downtown, that takes care of the, you know, our furnace in the basement, it's just a pipe, you know, the heat is changing. That's that's more long term, but but, but that's an idea I like to throw out there. People, uh, 
uh, like myself, you know, I'm 72 now. Uh, Nick talked about having a plan, and I think that's really great. But if you're 35, it's, it's, it's a little easier to say, okay, I can do something over 20 years than if you're 72. So um, if you can take some of that burden off, I, I really do believe that nobody should be putting a furnace down in their basement anymore. That everybody should be bringing the electricity up. And I think those, those make sense, those kind of ideas. But, but to say someone can't hang a mini split off the front of the building because it's a store, I'm not sure that makes the same, the same thing, uh, the same amount of sense. And, and uh, the city heat is an opportunity that we have here that most people don't have. And, and I do think it's the kind of project that would come under that Inflation Reduction Act infrastructure building. So, and it's more long term, but um, if you could do that with federal money so that you had, instead of 19 businesses hooked up to it, you had 100 hooked up to it, with most of the capital cost defrayed or, or taken care of, um, that would work. People are also scared of taking on debt because the 800 pound gorilla in the room is the North Bank, North Branch, and the Mississippi River. And no one knows when it comes back. And if you take on that couple hundred thousand in debt and it floods again, then what happens? Right. Mm -hmm. All right, this is some hands that I haven't seen before. So. Sure. Yeah. Uh, my name is Chris Campbell. I live in Gallison Hill. Um, I think about the financing in three parts, right? There's the sort of the bridge to help get people over the, the immediate need. There's the, um, you know, paying for, you know, uh, re, uh, refurbishment that needs to be made that doesn't have a case, business case, that for buildings that, you know, can't or shouldn't be brought back, have replaced that. But I think there's an important third part too. And I think that there are some additional financing options um, and funding options on that piece. It, and that is the sort of the, the long-term development of commercial, residential, and certain types of infrastructure. Um, and we had needs before the flood happened. We had you know an aging and insufficient um, housing stock. Um, we had um, you know a declining downtown workforce um, that wasn't hadn't fully come back yet from the pandemic. Um, we have. Um, uh, uh, an energy infrastructure that needs to be made more sustainable. Um, and I think that there's an opportunity um, to invest at scale in more housing that can support um, you know, businesses in a compact area that has a lower energy footprint. And a lot of that, if you can do it, um, if you can do it in a comprehensive way, Substantial portions of that do have a revenue stream. You know, people pay for housing. Um, if businesses have, you know, a, um, a, a space that they can be in, they ordinarily, you know, help contribute to that. I think what's really needed is the vehicle to get us there in a comprehensive way and to do it much faster than it will happen organically. Um, and that's where I think that, you know, in addition to some financial support, but in addition, there are some just some organizational and structural supports that the, uh, I think the state especially um, could provide the city or the, and or the region um, to help you know those kinds of things happen. I think if you create something, I, you know, the thing that comes to my mind, and maybe it's not exactly this, is some sort of development authority that has the ability to build things and borrow and deal with counterparties and deal with existing finance agencies and deal with federal programs and deal with state programs. Um, and can create some impetus and some action and some mission and has, is empowered with some of the financing and funding tools to make that happen. Um, that doesn't help the first two phases a whole lot, right? But I think that that big, that, that, that third phase is going to be um, a hugely expensive and necessary phase, but it's also a phase that I think has um, has the potential to generate some of its own revenue and create um, something new out of this that is long-term, you know, more sustainable and can be a, and an important part of Montpelier's future. Um, Thank you. Okay, so yes, we're gonna go here, and then what we need to kind of 
prioritize the ideas. We're going to prioritize really quickly. Okay, okay let's be quick, everyone. Uh, Josh Drone, uh, Montpelier resident and community and economic development specialist for the city. Just to follow up with that gentleman was saying about the dis district heat, um, that is a strategy in our local hazard mitigation plan, and it is something that the state will be looking at to do a scoping study um, on with this advanced FEMA funding, um, in addition to two other scoping studies. And so the goal would be to identify, to do the scoping, to see what the overall project would cost, feasibility to lift as many commercial, um, to get as many commercial buildings on the district heating um, system. So that's that's already in the works. That's that's what our intention is to access that funding. So, uh, absolutely. What are the other two? Um, the other two are uh, individual structures, rather than residential structures, uh, and then the third one is the riverine uh, corridor. Yeah. What additional uh, measures could be done in the watershed to prevent flows? So. Okay. Thank you. And then one more thing, um, just because I tried to fish this in 2020 during COVID, and I'm Trying, trying to pitch it again in 2023. Uh, how many uh, here have mutual funds, stocks, or bonds? Raise your hand. Mutual funds, stocks, or bonds? Raise your hand. How many are invested local? Raise your hand. It's very hard to do. Exactly. We need to make it less hard to do, and we need to move 23% of our retirement accounts to our local community. Right. You know, 2020 was a, was a better thing during COVID. You know, 23, 22, it doesn't fly up. And, <laughs> and where are the, where are the banks? Okay, okay, well then. Where are the banks? I, totally, but I, I, I'm not a business owner, but, you know. All right, so we just have a couple minutes. So yes, so, thank you. Uh, so uh, I just want folks to know um, about a bill that I put in, for, uh, that I requested already. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are aware that the state of Vermont is suing big oil uh, for consumer uh, protection for fair, uh, um, unfair and deceptive practices. Uh, that is a judicial way to get big oil to pay, but there is actually a legislative way to go after big oil. Specifically, uh, super funds were created through uh, legislation. And so uh, I'm having conversations already with folks about creating a climate super fund. Right, like this is big oil's mess. They need to pay a substantial portion of what we are all paying right now. And so this is not gonna be an immediate solution. Like this is gonna take some time, but I just want folks to know that this is on my radar and I am gonna chase this down um, because they need to pay. And it, it's not just about them lying. It's, it's about this is your mess. You need to pay for it. Yeah. 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 Um, just quickly, Christine Zaki, um, I'm on Foster Street in Montpelier, and um, I'm, in, I, I'm in the philanthropic sector, and just wanted to throw out that private philanthropy is, you know, can be a piece of the puzzle, certainly the dollars behind private philanthropy are dwarfed by government dollars, but, um, you know, private philanthropy can help fill in gaps for projects, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and so, you know, would have put it on the radar screen, there are local funders, and also, you know, if we were to come up with interesting, innovative ways to demonstrate climate resiliency, you know, there might be national funders that are interested. Absolutely. And the community the foundation is there. Yep, absolutely an important piece of the puzzle. One last thing, and then we're going to prioritize. Okay, I just wanted to follow up on Anne's statement because I'm a big, um, proponent of holding the oil companies um, responsible. And I just wanted to say that over 40 municipalities and states have filed suits to hold the major oil companies uh, responsible. And the one that is in the state court now for Vermont, Vermont uh, versus Exxon, uh, as she said, is, uh, that was filed in um, 2021 under PJ Donovan, and it's now in the state court, which is a good place to be. And uh, so there's um, hope that, um, so they're not asking for in, uh, payment of environmental damages, but they're uh, asking for a certain amount for each violation of the Consumer uh, Protection Act. But also, and I, I just have to say that I love this term, they're um, being asked to disgorge <clears throat> their profits, yeah. their profits from the entire time that they have known about this, that their own scientists have known about the harm they were 
causing to the extent that they, they adapted their own projects using their own scientists' um, results that showed that there was, was going to be more. Okay, so um, yes, so uh, the disgorgement would be from the time they knew, which could be traced back to uh, 1960-something, uh, to, to currently. And I mean, that is such a stratospheric amount of money. But um, in the meantime, I think that this, uh, this idea of modeling our super fund after New York State. And there also is a way of, there are people uh, who are, can, um, look, can, can look in the future and really zero in on the future cost of remediation. This has been done in, um, in Oregon and it's been done in Philadelphia and it can be done. And one of these things about the philanthropy, there's the possibility of um, of uh, of a city suing on a specific event. These precedents have happened. The problem is, on computer doesn't have any money. The state has limited resources. Philanthropy can come in and provide seed money to the first stages of a lawsuit. Just I can talk to you about that later. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. No. Okay, so in our eight minutes, what we are tasked with here is taking all of the various ideas that everyone has had and trying to prioritize the top three that have the most consensus, that have the most excitement, that folks feel again are could be the most impactful, actionable, and unified. So we'll just quickly run through the big ones we heard, and then we can have folks respond. So, do you want to go? Yeah, I um, thought. Let me try this, and if this fails, I'll go there. Okay, so the first one, I think to Jeff's point, not enough money, not getting it soon enough. So an idea special session to redirect current resources sooner. Uh, could be ARPA SRF funds or potentially going to new funds like bonding for an emergency fund. Um, as a piece of that, we must identify the need. So we catalog the need out there. And under that, we'll be creating a task force to identify individuals and business needs. So we've got. I'm just going to add to that one that it would also include, I heard the idea to set up a small group to canvas and go door to door to collect data and identify need. Um, and, and that in area, I believe, is a task force called the Individual Need and Family Needs Task Force. State. It's a state. A state one. Okay, thank you. Or do you need to Got it. Great. Um, in addition to that, District Chief, it sounds like we're beginning that. Um, and under Um, development authority, again, this is kind of long-term resilience, so a development authority would be empowered with financial authority and potentially be able to also um, be able to create money of its own. Federal advocacy, and then big oil. And the big oil is going after big oil, making sure that oil pays I just want to say one sentence, which is that I think it's really important to come up with funding right now, like he said, but also funding for infrastructure, flood mitigation, so that as business owners, as homeowners, if we rebuild, it doesn't just keep flooding, 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 flooding. So there's stage one, we need help now to even stay in business and come back. Stage two, we need funding to be able to make sure we don't keep flooding and keep not being able to come back. Yeah. When you come up with that price tag, I feel like that goes into the big price tag. Right. It's like, how much is it going to cost to do that? Well, when I heard you say there's $2.3 billion sitting there. It's public information. But it's been appropriated for things. It just hasn't been spent yet. So it's money that's going to hang out with the state, right? Yeah. It is earning interest income for Vermonters, so it's earning us. But the taxpayers should not have to pay all of this 
in bonds and Right. We need to come out with a price tag and, and make sure they know that we have a huge need. Some of that $2.3 billion has to come for this, or we aren't going to have a downtown. So it sounds as if, or you guys help me here, is there a consensus with one of the big ideas coming out is we must first identify the yes. we do that task force, whether mm -hmm. we do it you know, through canvassing, you have to identify yeah. businesses and individuals, and it needs to be done as soon as possible. And yeah. infrastructure. Yeah. Well, yeah. I hope every group. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. Need yeah. To, we need to know, yeah. we need to know we need facts and data to make any set of decisions. And we right now need to organize them and not just all the kind of guessing and right. rumor mongering. Okay. I'd put it under the category of recovery and resiliency. Like that's what we're, we're trying to get the price tag for is both the recovery aspect of it and then the resiliency aspect of it in the future. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Did you hear what he just said? I think it's important. Just, I would call, I'd call it um, recovery and resiliency, quantifying recovery and resiliency costs. Because it's, it's both the individual and business recovery, but it's more the public resiliency in the future. And, and yes. both of those need to be. But those have sort of separate uh, timelines. Yes. yes. Yes, they do. That, that yeah. recovery yeah. thing yeah. is immediate. Yeah. Resiliency, yeah. we've got a little bit of time, but we need to be thoughtful as we define that side of Okay. And then is there agreement that once those needs are identified, that there needs to be both federal and state advocacy to redirect or potentially raise additional funds? Yeah. I think we could put it in that. I heard the idea that I thought was brilliant, which is to reprioritize to look at municipal yeah. funds, and maybe state as well, you know, like the, just the different funds and reprioritize. And the city as well. Yeah. yeah. So at all levels, the city, state, and federal level. Could we? Get a list of all the things people have talked about here, the possible sources, yes. the private philanthropy, yes. the state, the... Yes. So Maggie has been definitely taking notes throughout all the ideas. Diligently taking notes throughout. So now all the ideas and um, resources. All right, so that's two. Um, Can I just have a third? One, are there any bankers here? Any people that represent the banks? I mean, which one are they in this discussion? Or the credit unions? I mean, Northwest Savings Banks is a pretty damn local bank. And so is the credit union. So, I mean, part of, part of my comments were, were you, you know, uh, you, you need to have somebody who can talk that language to that. I, I think that is a resource. That is a resource. You need to be able to talk the language of finance to, to the, and you need somebody who can do that on behalf of, on behalf of the community. Okay. Question. Yes. Specific question. I think we gotta go. Yeah. 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 Yeah.